Welcome back, Jeff and Jackie from Minnesota. To your first home, not your second home, this is your first home. Welcome to my mother-in-law who's here, Marty Kay. We just moved her down from El Dorado Hills, so she's here to be with us now. Not an easy adjustment, but we like having her near us again. She, you lived here for a long, long time before you moved up there, and she's been up there for 20 years, and we have her back. We look at us like grown-up people, all of us in one building, looking almost kind of normal. It's super great. This is a celebratory day. I never thought in this country we would ever say, I can't believe we get to congregate as a church again, but... It was a weird way of getting us to not be able to do that, but we get to congregate again, and I think we should praise God that he sustained us through this whole thing, and we still have our same bond. So, just a beautiful, beautiful thing. Now we just got to get the rest of our church back, and I didn't mean that in a loving, encouraging way, not in a, not in a judgmental way at all. We just want all of us to understand what it is to be a part of the brotherhood and sisterhood of Christ. Amen? Amen. Happy Father's Day to all of you. I was uh, awoken this morning by my, who, oh, what, what is going on here? Did somebody mess around with my notes? This is last week's sermon. Let's put that there. Um, this is my last message on 1 Peter. Next week, Brian is going to speak on the very last passage in 1 Peter on anxiety. So if that makes you anxious, this will be perfect sermon for you to come to. <clears throat> if you have a Bible, open it up to 1 Peter chapter 4. If you don't have a Bible, there are Bibles in the chairs around you. If you want to pull out your phone and not Instaface, Graham, whatever it is you do on that dang phone, and just read a Bible app, <clears throat> Tyler, I'm looking at you. No using the phone for anything other than the Bible this morning. You with me? If you can, stand with me this morning for the reading of God's Word. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. <clears throat> Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you. This is what we just sang about. <clears throat> As though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a meddler. Love that word. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God first. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God. And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. You may be seated. Peter is, of course, continuing this theme of suffering for following Jesus. And as I said last week, Peter is not like the Apostle Paul. Peter doesn't follow a train of thought from A to B to C to D to E to F. Peter has several points, and he circles the same points in different ways over and over because he wants to make sure we grasp it. And this morning's passage I find incredibly encouraging. <clears throat> Again, what? remember this circular argument. He says over and over that Jesus has suffered for us. And he has handed us victory. And therefore, it's okay if we suffer because we are following in his steps. Second of all, through his suffering, we have been handed grand nobility. We'll talk more about this this morning. Remember, we are his sacred possessions. Remember, we were that, that tarnished bull in the antique store that he bought back and he purified and set apart for only his divine purposes. And remember our statement I keep saying, nobility begets a noble response. This is who we are. We are noble people, and it begets a noble reaction. But, but, as Peter keeps saying, don't expect things to go well, because they will not. 
1 Peter 4.12, beloved, this is how he starts the passage. Do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you. You will look like an idiot to people for following Jesus and for acting like Jesus. And what does it look like to act like Jesus? We don't have to win with people because we have already won. We, don't ha- we can forgive people because he has already forgiven us. We can be liberal with our money because he is so liberal with us. And by the way, he owns all of it anyway. We don't have to push our morality, but rather we are just here to share the excellencies of God. And we can give and we can serve and we can love without ever being recognized because his gaze is fixed upon you and his ears are pointed in your direction for your every call. So as Peter heads towards the end of this great letter that he wrote to kind of buoy these churches up, what does he say to them in these closing statements? I find this section, like I said, very encouraging. And what I want to do is try to grasp this section by answering two simple questions. First of all, how do we not let suffering handle us? And I think we know what that means. We grew up with horses, and we had really good horses, and we had really ornery horses. We had this little Shetland pony named Queenie, or excuse me, named named Poppets. In fact, Andy Lawrence has now nicknamed me Poppets, which is just a horrible name to me. It sounds like this endearing dad statement. It's not. It's the name of a short, stubby pony that will never be broken by anybody, then kicks walls and chews wood. Poppets was a horrible horse. We finally broke this horse, but gosh, it was not easy to do. You know, when you get on a horse, the horse can sense if you're afraid. It either handles you or you handle it. This is what suffering is like. So how do we not allow suffering to handle us? And then second of all, how do we then respond once we understand that? So let's start with the first question. How do we not let suffering handle us? And how do we cling to God instead? Life and its problems, and in this case particularly suffering for Jesus, and for following in the steps, it either handles us or we can use it to create immense beauty in our life. And, and specifically what P, the beauty Peter is talking about creating is actually a spirit of rejoicing all the time, no matter what you're going through. through. Listen to how, how he keeps saying this in verse 13. But rejoice, he says. Verse 13, he says again, that you may also rejoice and be glad. Verse 14, if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, blessed, rejoiced, glad. When we follow the pattern set before us by Jesus, and when we get hammered for it, we are fortunate, Peter says. We are glad, we are blessed, we are happy even. And why? He's going to give us three reasons. The first reason is what we just sang about. Suffering purifies our faith. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes to test you. Peter calls it a fiery trial. Why fire specifically? Well, we already looked at this in the very beginning of this whole letter, 1 Peter 1.6. In this you rejoice, there's that word again, though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes though it is tested by fire, may be found result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Remember what we said way back in chapter 1, several months ago. It can create refinement in our lives. It should create refinement, but it will only refine us if we grasp the purpose of it. If If suffering comes our way and it is nothing more than a raft that picks you up into the water and takes you down to the end, knocking you off of every rock, off of every cliff, and depositing you into the muddy crag of a pond that's at the end of it, it will not do this for you. We have to know the purpose of the suffering. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you is the word as though something strange were happening to you. The word test means to prove. It means to show you what you really are. 
It, it means, to, it's, it's, a, it's a word that actually is like that person that just pokes at you. I have a personality like this, just in case you don't know. I like to poke at people a lot. I'm a, and when people don't like it, to me, it's like a shark. You're chumming the water. If I find out you don't like it, I come in harder, which is really gracious and very Christian of me. It's a very unfortunate personality trait. I keep telling myself Jesus is like this. Nobody else in my life is convinced. But this is what this word means. See, it's godly. It means to poke at you, to show you the reaction that is within you. And this word fiery trial, the Greek word is porosis, it means to purify. So what takes place in suffering is, it's a fire that purifies you because it pokes at you and it shows you in a mirror what is really going on inside you. You see, the impure cannot handle the fire. The fire separates the two. This is about our faith. When the world pushes on us and the world shoves you, right? It shows you what you trust. It shows you what you believe in at that moment. So what do we trust in? Marital perfection? Sexual satisfaction all the time? Career? Savings? Perfect protection and safety? A world that does the things the way we want every time? To not ever be interrupted for life to always work perfect for us? We are all divided in our hearts, and we know it when the fire hits because it pokes us and our reaction displays what we really believe at that moment. Remember that word we looked at several weeks ago, epithumia. Epithumia, it means we have over-desires. The desires are fine. It's when they become over-desires that we have a problem. This is where we see our inadequacies and our false trust. I love what God said through Jeremiah the prophet to Judah when she was so wayward at the very beginning of the book of Jodah, of Jeremiah, chapter 2, verse 27. Who say, he says, to a tree, you are my father, and to a stone you gave me birth, for they have turned their back to me and not their face. But in the time of their trouble, they say, arise and save us. But where are your gods that you made for yourself? Let them arise, and they can save you in your time of trouble. For as many as your cities are your gods, O Judah. You see, you cannot see yourself accurately when you're on vacation. Lynn and I, I preached Sunday. We got a crack of dawn at 4 in the morning Monday. We flew to Maui, and we got home at 10 o'clock last night, which was cutting it a little close, I know. But I assure you, I'm awake. I'm very awake right now. But Jerry Grossi was beautiful. He texted me this morning, did you go home safely? I think he was nervous. He had to pull a rabbit out of a hat this morning and preach on some innate passage. Jerry, what, did you have a passage you were ready for? You did. Wow. He'll hold on to that, folks. It was a gem. I can't wait till we hear this thing. You can't see your true self on vacation. Everybody can do great on vacation. Although what I love on vacation is how horrible people are on vacation. That's my favorite thing about vacation. As I watch people and they blow up, I watched this guy yesterday just scream at this guy at the airport whose whose food wasn't being prepared properly. And I'm thinking, dude, this is you relaxed. What do you look like at home when you're poked at? You know what I'm saying? We see our hearts, our thinking, our theology, our faith when the fire comes. I love what Tim Keller said. Whenever your life becomes meaningless, listen to this, whenever your life becomes meaningless, it's because something besides God that you have put your functional trust in has died. Why is that? Because false gods can't take the heat of reality. If God is your trust, You will never feel meaningless. You'll never feel bored. You'll never feel hopeless. When I am confronted with someone that differs in their opinion on, say, the pandemic, like with a mask or the vaccine, my reaction gives my heart away. When someone is in need and it doesn't fit my schedule or my financial plan or my desires, my reaction gives my faith away. When I'm afraid or anxious, my reaction gives my faith away. When life doesn't go the way I want it to, and it's amazing, it almost never does, 
My reaction gives my heart away. It is mistrust in God. Our beautiful God burns away the impurities in our thinking when we encounter testing, but only if we allow the fire to show us our lousy theology and we change our perspective to trust. You see, when it hits us, when we get poked at, we're supposed to be aware of our reaction and say, does this seem calm? Does this seem like a guy who's convinced that the God of the universe came here and died on a cross for me? What what would he not do for me? Our reaction gives us away. Second of all, suffering reminds us of our royalty. 1 Peter 4.13 But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ... You are blessed because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Remember our our second Corinthians study. It's called messianic suffering. What is true of Messiah is now in large part true of you and I. When we suffer for doing the right thing, it means you are known as part of the royal family. You are suffering for following Jesus. It means you carry his last name. It is even stronger than this. When you invoke the name of Jesus, and by invoke the name of Jesus, I mean by the way you live and love. I don't mean that you have a magic show and you just keep saying in the name of Jesus, right? That's not what it means to invoke the name of Jesus. When you invoke the name of Jesus by the way you love and the way you live, it carries deep power. And the Messiah, as the chief temple builder, will come in all of his glorious spirit and he will dwell in your midst. I actually signed up for my first massage in a year and a half. And I go in there and this gal comes out and I lay on the table and my, you know, I put my face through the, the giant jelly donut and she starts massaging me and Linda thinks I'm weird because I, I, I get in there and everybody else wants to be silent. I want to engage with the masseuse. I want to talk with them. I want to find out what makes them tick. I've got 50 minutes to see if I can be a part of their heart. Tom Aftel would, be this, would do this exactly. And I began to talk to this gal and ask this gal, what was your last year like? Tell me what you're feeling. Tell me what your experience was. She's 27. She's my son's age. It was really cool. And I was telling her, you know, oh, you're, you're, my, you're my kid's age. This is so cool. And we began to talk. And she began to say, you know, like when the, when the pandemic hit, I wanted to kill myself. I go, what do you mean? She said, I thought the world was ending. I go, oh my gosh, how scary that must have felt for you to not feel like you had any answer. And I'm not going to just say, well, guess what? I've got a Bible, you know. (laughs) I just listened and asked, and it was cool. God goes, tell her about Jubilee. So I began to share with her this ancient Jewish tradition from the Old Testament of Jubilee and resting the earth every 50 years. And she was like, wow. I go, yeah, it's, it's apparently in the Old Testament of the Bible. Go figure. (laughs) I got about 30, 40 minutes into this massage, and it was a great massage, by the way, and, and like, I didn't know what else to say, so I just began to pray for her. I could just feel, I could just feel God's presence in that room. I don't know how she was affected. I don't know if she was affected, but something happens when we live and love well in the name of Jesus, Amen. We invoke the name, and it carries deep power. And the Messiah, as the chief temple builder, will come in in all of his glorious spirit and dwell in your midst. This is what Peter means by verse 16. Yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. You see, that's our heritage. My heritage is far beyond being a McBride, and that's a great heritage I assure you, my dad, my grandfather, my great-grandfather that started farming the farm back in Iowa, that is nothing compared to the heritage I have by carrying the name of Christ. It brings royalty. And again, you suffer not because of your bad choices or because, quite frankly, you're acting just like the world, putting your rights and your freedom first. That's why verse 13 says, Rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings meaning not your self-driven sufferings that you sometimes call Christianity, but because you are a follower of Jesus. You glorify 
in that name that you share with him, his powerful presence dwells with his royal kids. I think that is so awesome to know I can be face down with a towel over my head in the most vulnerable position ever, and the Spirit of Christ can descend in that room on a pagan gal who has no idea who God is. And this transformative thing, this very thought that our feet are on Jesus' path to Calvary's destination explodes joy and meaning in our lives. We see this in the book of Acts. I love this passage. We studied this years ago in Acts 5. And when they had called in the apostles, they beat them and they charged them not to speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And then they left in the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name of Christ. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. No fear, no no hiding, no stress, just this rejoicing of, wow, we carry the name of royalty upon us. In this, Peter, in these two first points, Peter's bringing together a thought that comes directly out of the prophet Isaiah of suffering for following God. When he predicted his own death in Mark 14, Jesus spoke about the same prophecy. But immediately after his death, those who remain his followers were going to see these very two things, that our faith would be refined and we will carry the name upon our souls This is what the prophet Zechariah said in chapter 13. And I will put this third into the fire and refine them as one refined silver. There's the first piece. And test them, poke at them as gold is tested. And they will call upon my name and I will answer them. Why? I will say they are my people. They carry my royalty. And they will say the Lord is my God. That should be an incredible encouragement to us. Our suffering never is meaningless. He pokes at us so we can see that we're relying upon a God that is made of stone and rock so that we can turn to the only one who gives life and then realize in the midst of that that we carry his royalty upon us. Well, finally, he gives a third encouragement, but it doesn't sound very encouraging. See everything in the light of the final judgment. Verse 17, for it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, and it does, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the the ungodly and the sinner? This is about the time when we think, I think you should have stopped Peter at the first two. That was really encouraging. And now you're telling me I'm going to be judged. And that's kind of making me not want to try anything. What on earth would this, how on earth would this encourage me to lay my life down for others and follow Jesus? He gives a whole bunch of reasons. First of all, the outcome is not in doubt. When Jesus rose from the dead, he beat death and darkness by being everything they are not. And in that resurrection, he unleashed a renewal of the cosmos that he will not fit complete or it will not stop until he's absolutely finished. The the end is absolutely set. So the first piece about judgment that should relax us is we already know what he's going to do. Second of all, the outcome is actually supposed to be vindication for us. When we are all before Christ, saved and unsaved, the unsaved will realize we were right. And more importantly, we will realize we bet on the right horse. All of us at times think, is is this real? (laughs) I've invested my whole life studying the Bible and praying and sharing Christ with people and pursuing Jesus. And every now and then I go, gosh, I hope this is real. And what he's saying to us in this judgment is, you will not have to wonder anymore. You will realize it's real. Third, God takes our lives very seriously. Just like Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3, there will be a judgment, and it starts with us. But not to decide if we are worthy to be with him. Jesus already took care of that. We are worthy. We are worthy of the blood of Christ. 
but to recognize what we have done in following him in the pattern of Jesus. And whatever didn't fit, he's going to burn it away anyway. Fourth, it will produce, it should produce empathy in us. The judgment, the thought of judgment should produce deep empathy. I love what he says in verse 18. The righteous, that's us, is scarcely saved. Isn't that a weird phrase? Like if I look at Tammy and I say, Tammy, you, you are barely saved. Most of you go, God, that's rude. But that's literally what he's saying. You are scarcely saved. The holiest among us is in desperate need of saving. I have news for all of you. We are not getting in by the skin of our teeth. You have no skin. You are getting in because of the blood of Christ. And so am I, amen? There's not one thing you are going to do inside or outside these walls that is going to make God go, oh, now you're worthy. Not, just relax with all that. You are already worthy. We are getting in because of the death of Christ. Let that remind us how blessed we are and, and, and bleed then for the lost. They are not the enemy. They need the same thing that you and I do. And they're in the same position you and I are in, save for the blood of Christ. And finally, it's supposed to produce, the judgment is supposed to produce not panic, but deep gratitude. Everybody wants judgment. I know that sounds strange. I've said this before, though. If you watch an atrocity on television, anybody that watches like an innocent older person walk down the street and have 10 youths jump them and beat them, and the the world reacts to that, why do we react? Because we want resolution. We want justice. We want God to ultimately make this place right, and he will. And for that, we should be in deep gratitude because it not, means not only will he do it, but we need have no fear because we are his royalty. We carry his name. Well, then with this, how do we respond? Given this deep encouragement that he's given us, that he will purify our faith, that he'll poke at us through suffering to say, what are you trusting in? What God do you think is going to deliver you? And not only do we carry the royal name of Christ so that when we suffer for following Jesus, he's saying, man, you're on a good path. You're on the path to Calvary. You're on the same path my son was on. And not only will he vindicate us and make everything right, we should then have a response to this. Well, Peter gives us three responses. Here's the first one. Don't be surprised. Don't live shocked in life. Beloved, do not be shocked at the fiery trial when it comes upon you. That's a command. Don't be surprised as if it's some strange thing that we're not prepared for. If you're shocked, you are not ready for life. Jesus was the perfect man, and yet he suffered terribly to bring about God's purposes. Why would you and I somehow avoid this when he could not. Most of the pain we experience, I personally believe in life, is because of the shock, not because of the experience itself. Grief will not destroy you. It hurts like heck, but it will not destroy you. Surprise will. Jesus was deeply grieved. Jesus was never surprised. Did you hear that? Jesus went through intense grief, people rejecting him, people accusing him falsely, people abandoning him, people thinking the worst of him. He was never shocked. He knew what was coming. He knew what was next. Not my will, Father, but thine be done. Remember what we said earlier, right? Gird up the loins of your mind as if you're going to battle. Weaponize your thinking with the truth that Jesus suffered and suffered for you. Number two, make sure you follow Jesus' pattern and not some lousy forgery. I've seen so much of this in this last year and a half. I've seen so many followers of Christ follow a forgery of the gospel and not the real gospel. Verse 15, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or a meddler. I just think that's so great that that's next to those others. I'll let you work out why. Don't make life worse than it already is, right? We will already suffer 
for following Jesus well. And we will already suffer just because we're on this planet. Don't add to it by acting like the world. Again, by aligning yourself with a tribe like a political party. Asking dumb questions like, where will this all end up? Gosh, that's a lousy question for a Christian to ask. If you're asking that question, call another believer that knows the word of God and have him actually share with you where this will all end up. By not freaking out because the world is falling apart. Or fighting back when Jesus gave himself up on the cross and already handed you victory. By treating people like they're the enemy when they are not. Or by lowering your royal priesthood calling to something as ridiculously low as moralizing the society. People do not need their lives cleaned up. People need saving. People do not need a better path to walk. People need God. And by the way, that word meddler, it means busybody. It's involving yourself in things just for the sake of involving yourself with things rather than for the redemption of their life. We must elevate above this pattern of this world. People are falling apart around us. Six months? No, that wasn't that long. Maybe four months into the pandemic. I heard about the story of parents who took their teenager to the pediatric ER. And I've shared this story, so I think you've heard this. And they get to the pediatric ER, and the whole ER is full. Every exam room and every other door has a guard outside of it with the door open because they were on suicide watch. People are falling apart. 60% of voters think the other party constitute a threat to America. Somebody's wrong. More than 40% of them call them evil. 20% call the other party animals. One in three now, one in three people in our country think violence is justified to advance their party's goals. Most of us don't even know people anymore that aren't like us. Look at your friends. Look at the people you spend time with. Are they just like you? Something's wrong. This is not the church God is building. God is building a church where neither race Right? Ethnic background, socioeconomic status, none of that matters. He's building a multicolored, multinational, multi financial, not financial church in the body of Christ. Suicide is at an all time high. Anxiety and depression, the highest it's ever been in history. The average American in just a few years has gone from 3.2 friends, not a high number, by the way, to 1.8. Friendship across our nation has been cut literally in half. And a lot of that, I think, is linked to social media, the isolation of humanity. 40% of Americans now have zero to one confidant. 40% of our country now has zero to one people that they feel like they can go to to share about their life. People have no one to even process with. Doctors are now calling loneliness the greatest pathology of our time. And we have an answer. We have the answer. The God who made us came to rescue us for only the sake of being close to us. And we, at whatever level, know that. What grandeur we have. But they won't listen if we do not love well and live well like Jesus did. And finally, Peter tells us to entrust ourselves to God Check our mistrust when you get poked at. Where is my mistrust? And change who I entrust myself to. 
Verse 19, therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their very souls to a faithful creator while doing good. And trust means to commit. It means to set yourself before. It literally has the idea of making a deposit, like in a bank. To make a deposit in a place that's insured. Jesus has proven himself. Jesus gets the benefit of the doubt. He suffered for us, not for himself. What God can say that? There is no God that can say that. Our God gets loneliness. Our God gets trauma. Our God gets hurt and rejection. Our God gets isolation. Our God gets lack of recognition. Our God gets deep loss. And when we entrust ourselves to him, we don't just have his empathy. We don't just have the gaze of God and the ears of God upon us. We have the God who made us and who holds life in the palm of his hand gazing upon us with the power to actually do something about it. Daily, entrust yourself to the one that would die for you, and it will change everything in your life. Let's pray.